Well, praise God. I thought Dave was going to preach my message, but you know, thank you, Dave. I, I do appreciate that. The great thing is, is as I'm sitting here, you know, God put a message on my heart. Now, I guess I should back up. Because a lot of people don't know me. Our church is growing so quickly. They're saying, who's this guy? He doesn't look like pastor. He's better looking. But, uh, <laughs> and younger. And younger. And sorry, pastor, if you're watching. I didn't really mean that. But uh, I'm Cliff Anderson, uh, you know, and I have the honor and the privilege of, of bringing forth a message and preaching when pastor's not here a lot of times. Uh, my wife and I, our children... Uh, son and his family and our daughter and her family have been coming here for, I don't know, 14 years, about 14 years, and we've been blessed in this place, and it's just an honor for me to be able to give back to the Lord and to, and to be able to bless God's people, and, you know, and I take it really seriously to be up here, so praise God. Now that I've introduced who I am, Cliff Anderson, uh, as I said, I'm sitting there and, the, you know, the, the Holy Spirit always brings everything together. Do you ever notice that? When, when God is in it, everything flows together. Everything works together. Everything builds on itself. You know, my message, and I started off, I, I want, as we're going into 2015, God put on my heart that, you know, one, I need a, a message to encourage his people that he is with them and that we're not going into 2015 alone that we're going there with God, and God has been there before us, and he's prepared a way, the way for us, and, you know, so we don't have any, we shouldn't have any fear. There's no fear going into 2015 if you're going into it with the Lord, and God has made provision for all of our needs. So, one, it was an encouragement, and that God is with us. So, as we're singing the songs, now, Esteban doesn't know what my message title is. We haven't even talked about it, but he picked, where, he picked the the, uh, the songs in the worship time, and the songs are all I need, that God is all I need. And I'm sitting there saying, praise you, God. Yes, you are all I need. Then it's Christ is enough for me. And that's part of my message. It's all tied together. Then Dave gets up and talks about the faithfulness of God in his, in his, uh, with money and with, with finances. All of these things tie together. So praise God. God is a good God. And you're here for a reason. I believe God put a message on my heart. You know, there's two things that I can talk about, and I speak about, you know, a lot. One in work is bearings. I work for a bearing company. I've been in it for 35 years. You know, ball bearings, roller bearings, things like that. I don't believe you came to listen to me talk about bearings this morning, right? You probably would have stayed in bed if that's what you knew I was going to talk about. So I'm not going to talk about that. The other thing that I'm comfortable in talking about is the Word of God and, and bring forth the Word of God because, you know, I empty myself and I ask the Lord to fill me. And it's not me. It's the anointing of God that goes out. And I've sought the Lord and I asked him for a message for this body. And I believe he's given me one for this body. So, you know, I, I just want to pray now and then get into my message for this morning. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to bring forth your word. I thank you, Lord God, that, that you're a faithful God. That God, you know, if we, if we take that step towards you, you take two steps towards us, oh Lord God. And you reach out. Now, I surrender my will. I surrender myself to you, O oh Lord God. Father, I've done the preparation based on what I believe you gave me, Lord God. And now I ask that the Holy Spirit will bring forth your word, Lord, this morning, anointed, so that your people will hear it and be changed, not only moved, but changed by the word of God. Praise God. And uh, the other thing is Pastor and Sandra are away, obviously, with a well-deserved rest. It's been a very action-packed year for pastor, for, uh, for this church, with the building and with all the things that have gone on. So uh, I'd like to just pray for them as well. Uh, Father, we lift up Pastor and Sandra, Luke, Hannah, and Matthew, Lord. Father, as they're away and as they're taking this time of rest uh, and vacation together, Lord, we pray that you would keep your, your hedge of safety around them, a hedge of protection around them, that they would walk under the protection and under the provision of the 91st Psalm, O oh Lord God, and that you would give your angels charge over them. Father, we pray also, Lord, that this would be a time of refreshing and renewing and coming together as a family, getting closer as a family and as a family getting closer to you. And Father, we thank you for them, and we ask that you would continue to bless them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
So as we go into 2015, as I said before, God really put on my heart that, you know, we need to understand that we're not going into it alone, that we're going in, into 2015 with the Lord himself alongside of us, in front of us, and behind us. And so my message today is about the power of the Word of God. We need to have all of the power that God has given us as we walk through the world today. Uh, you know, it can be a scary time, and I'm not, you know, my message isn't talking about current events. I've done that in the past. My wife and I had a, a Signs of the Times home group. There's a lot of scary things that are going on. And, you know, if you turn on the news, it's pretty hard if you don't know the Lord not to really just want to go bury yourself someplace in a bunker and stay there and not, never come out again, right? Because the world is in turmoil. The world is upside down. But that's okay. Our God is always on the throne. Our God is always in charge. And what has he given us? He's given us tools and he's given us the ability to walk in victory, to walk in strength, and to walk in power regardless of what's going on around us. You know, we have the name of Jesus. God tells us in his word that, you know, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ, that we, in the name, Jesus said, in my name, you can cast out demons, and you can lay hands on the sick, and they shall be healed. So there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Christ. We sing, you know, the song, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power when we cover our family and cover ourselves with the precious blood of the Lamb Jesus. The enemy can't penetrate that. So we know about those. But there's also power in the Word of God. God, it says, you know, the Scriptures tell us, and I'm getting ahead of, you know, this is the great thing about God. I put a lot of stuff in, and then I let him take it out in the order he wants to, right? So praise God. You know, when we look about what the what the Bible says about the Word of God, what God himself says about his Word. His Word is contained in, in his Bible. This, and the Bible is true. Every word of the Bible is true. And I'll let you know what my reference point is and where I'm coming from right up front. If the Bible says that Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, I'm an engineer, but I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to figure out how that can happen. I don't have to go look it up. I don't have to you know, have a debate with people about it or not. The Bible says it. That's good enough for me. I believe it. If the Bible says that Jesus fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men, and then when you add the women and children in, if he fed them with a few loaves of bread and a few fish, I'm not going to try to figure out how that happens. I don't know how it, I do know how it happens. It's supernatural. We serve a supernatural God. And, you know, the, the Bible tells us that with man it may be impossible, but with God all things are possible. So we need to set the, the, the reference point of that what I'm talking about is a supernatural God. I'm not talking about some guy, some place that has some power. I'm talking about the supernatural God, the God that has the ability to part the Red Sea, the God that has the ability to raise his son from the dead, the God that has the ability to heal and deliver, and whatever circumstances you're in, that he has the ability to meet you there and meet your needs. That's the God I'm talking about. And he wrote this Bible. This is the Bible. This is his word. And his word has power. This is not just a book. And there's a lot of people, I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of churches that don't preach from the word of God. They get up and they talk a feel-good message, and they talk about you know, their opinions. Like I said, you didn't come here to hear me talk about my opinion, because you know, my opinion means nothing. You came, hopefully you came to hear me talk about the Word of God. And that's what it is, right? That's what the Bible is. It's the, uh, the Word of God with power. And this Word has such power in it. There are people that don't know about the power in the Word of God. Christians sitting in churches that don't know about the power of the Word of God. But when you leave here today, you're going to know about the power of the Word of God because that's what I'm talking about, people. I'm talking about the power that we have in the Word of God. There's everything you need to live is in this book. Every single thing you need to know, it explains who God is. He talks about himself. He talks about his son, Jesus Christ. He, he talks about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. He talks about the baptism of the Spirit. He tells us what we should do. And he also tells us what we shouldn't do. And that's the part that nobody wants to hear. That's when people start closing the book of the Bible because they don't want to hear what they shouldn't do. They want to hear all the feel-good stuff, 
but they don't want to feel all the stuff that says, don't do this. Don't do this anymore. Stop it. And the Word of God, when you get into the Word of God, it will convict you. It's a cleansing Word. And, you know, the other thing about the Word of God is, is, you know, the, the Bible tells us, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Too many people try to read the Word of God with their own understanding. And I've known people who have read the Word of God. They know it. They know every verse, every scripture, and they can turn them, twist them, and make them say whatever they want to do. So they can live a sinful life. They can read the Word of God, and they can justify everything they're doing by the Word of God. Because it's not, they haven't read it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you read the Word of God and then you, then you try to understand it with your own understanding, you're going to miss the mark. It's the only book that you have to know the author. And, if you, and you have to read it with the author sitting alongside of you. So when you go into the Word of God, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and give you revelation knowledge about what's in there and what you're reading. Because if you don't do that, you could miss the mark. And there are people who are living in sin and reading the Bible and going to churches, and somehow they're able to make the Word of God say what they want it to say. It's wrong. The Word of God should convict you. When I read the Word of God, if there's something wrong in my life, He shows it to me, and I'm convicted by it. And the next thing it does is it leads you to repentance. Because conviction is nothing unless you repent and you turn. And, you know, people misunderstand. And I'm going in a whole different direction, people. So just follow me. Hold on, because I don't know where we're going, but I know where, we, where I intended to go. But praise God. You know, praise God. You know, people get convicted, and then they get upset. They get mad. They blame a pastor. They blame somebody else. They blame God, and they turn away. Conviction is supposed to lead us to repentance. And repentance isn't just being, being upset that you got caught, okay? Let's make that clear, too. A lot of people say they repented because they were upset that they got caught. They weren't upset with what they did. They didn't care about what they did. They did care about the fact that they got caught. That's not repentance. Repentance is, true repentance is hating the sin that you used to be involved in so much that it's detestable to you, and you can't even imagine that you used to do that. And you turn from it because you have such disgust for it and where you were. That's true repentance. Anything less than that is just, you know, trying to placate yourself and feel good. When the Word of God convicts you, when the Spirit of God convicts you, you need to just shut the door on that. You need to change, and you need to turn away, and you need to do it immediately. So the Word of God, as I said before, it tells us what we should do, but it also tells us what we shouldn't do. It tells us how we're supposed to live our lives. It tells us what, we're, what God expects from us. And, and it's not just for us. You know, my daughter has a blog, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in, in uh, you know, Women Get Real, uh, a ministry. But I read something in a recent blog about Christmas, and it said, Jesus Christ, the only gift you're supposed to re-gift. And that's so true. You miss it if you don't re-gift Jesus. We're supposed to, you know, we get the gift of Jesus, and then we're supposed to give it to somebody else or give him to somebody else. We're supposed to re-gift Jesus over and over wherever we are, whether in the workplace, in the marketplace, at home, in our family. But, you know, we're supposed to be talking about Jesus. The Great Commission, and again, this wasn't in my notes, but I got to qualify that God's first and foremost concern is our salvation, and it's the Great Commission. He says over and over again, Go ye therefore into all the world, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And those that receive it will be saved. So that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get the good news, and we're supposed to bring it to others, and we're supposed to re-gift Jesus Christ. Now we'll get back on track. The supernatural word of God. Like I said, this is the word of God is, in, is contained in this book. And, you know, and God takes it seriously. 
He took the time, think about it, he took the, th- the time to write down and give, you know, now people will say there's 66 books and they're all written by different people and what have you. Everything, the Bible itself says that it's the divinely inspired word of God. Whoever wrote it was inspired by God himself. So God wrote this book. And God himself tells us what he thinks and how he feels about his word. If we look in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the word of God is alive. It's not just a book with pages in it. When we read the word of God, it comes alive. God himself comes off the pages, and he becomes alive in our lives. And that's why I say it, it leads us to you know, conviction and repentance, first off, on the first side. So it's, it's, it's alive, it's living, it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So when you read the Word of God, the intent is that it's going to be the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. God looks at your heart. You know, there's other scriptures that say man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And when you read the Word of God and you study the Word of God, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. And that's why it convicts, because it sees what's truly in your heart. You know, there's other scriptures that say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Have you ever said something that you wonder where that came from? I know I have. I'm not, you know, I'm no different than any of you, trust me. You know, and have you ever said something and you wonder where that came from? Well, it came out of your heart. You know, there's some rooms and some areas in your heart that maybe haven't been turned over to the Lord yet. That's just a side note, so you better think about that, okay? So praise God. You know, but the Word is alive. It's powerful. And, you know, Jesus, and you might have heard this before, but Jesus, when he was in the desert, right? Jesus was the, had the power of the Holy Spirit on him. He was the Son of God incarnate. He, he put down his godliness, and he came here as a man. But when he was in the desert after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came and tried to tempt him. And how did he defeat the devil? He didn't say, in my strength. He could have. He was God, right? He could have said, in my strength. He says, but the word of God says. He quoted the word when he says, you know, turn this bread into stone. You know, well, you know, Jesus quoted the scripture to the devil. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, which is in the, in the word. So the devil tried three times, and three times Jesus rebuked him with the word of God. And the devil finally realized that he was defeated. The devil was defeated because he couldn't stand against the word of God because there's power in the word of God. And the devil had to flee, not be, I mean... Jesus is Jesus, but again, he was a man when he was here. He was in a weakened state, but he spoke the word of God. The devil flee, had to flee because Jesus spoke the word of God to him, and he left, and he had to leave. Now, you could say this is coincidence, but I'm going to tell you a little story. When we were first saved, Louise was in the kitchen. We had on Jesus of Nazareth. I think it was the Easter time. Christmas time. We had Jesus of Nazareth playing on the television in our family room. And Louise is in the kitchen, and I'm doing stuff, and we're getting ready. And there's the part in Jesus of Nazareth where Jesus says, Satan, be gone, right, with power and with authority. Well, I had a curl on my family room chimney up on the roof. Soon as those words were spoken, Jesus be gone. I heard this tremendous crash, right? Or Satan be gone, right? Jesus said, Satan be gone. I heard this tremendous crash up on my family room. And I'm like, and I went out and the curl on my, on my chimney had just blown apart and was all over my roof. There's power. Now, was, was it a coincidence? I mean, it was immediate. Was it we were just saved? You know, was there some oppressive spirits that were around. I don't know what it was, but I can tell you that the power of the word of spoken word of God 
is just too powerful for, for the enemy to withstand. And when you speak the word of God in the name of Jesus with faith, then demons have to flee. And whatever your situation is gets turned around. We never put the curl back on the, on the uh, chimney, though. If, you're, if people are wondering, well, what happened after that? What's the rest of the story? We did fix the fireplace, and we took the bricks off, but we never put the curl back on. In, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, God himself says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man slash woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has given us his word in the Bible so that we may be fully equipped for every good work that he has planned for us to do, reaching out around us. In Isaiah 55, 11, he says, so, so shall my word be that goeth forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I have sent. God's saying his word is so powerful that once it left his mouth, once it is spoken forth, it can't return void. When God's word goes out, it has to accomplish whatever it was sent to do. When God speaks forth healing, it has to happen. When God uh, speaks forth deliverance, it has to happen. And it's all in his Bible. In, he has already spoken it. We just need to read it, believe it, and then speak it ourselves to our circumstances that are around us. We can't let our circumstances define who we are. We let the Word of God define who we are in Christ Jesus. It's the Word of God at alive and powerful and at work within us that makes a difference in our lives. If we don't have the word of God, we don't know who we are. We don't know what to do in those situations. If Jesus didn't know the word of God and the enemy came and tempted him, he would have sat there, I mean, forgive me for taking some liberties, but he would have said, hey, hey get away from me. You know, but instead, he knew the word of God. He was the Word. He is the Word of God. In John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when he spoke the Word of God, when he spoke uh, to the devil, he spoke the Word of God, and the devil had to flee. When we speak, we, us, same, us, when we speak the Word of God, it's not us. It's the Word of God. It's the blood of Christ. It's the name of Jesus. When we speak with power and when we speak the Word of God with power, the enemy has to flee. Don't get puffed up. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. You know, I, I, I once said it's, it's, it's like the, uh, when I was a kid, there used to be, the, I think it was Tom and Jerry cartoons, right? And, you know, the bulldog would be, be standing behind the mouse, right? And, he, and the mouse didn't know it. And the cat would come, and then he would stop, and he would get afraid. Huh? And then all of a sudden, the cat would run away, and the, and the mouse would be like, whew, yeah, that's right. You know, I'm tough. I'm bad. That's right. Don't mess with me, because I'm tough. He never realized that what the mouse saw was not him. I mean, what the cat saw was not him. He saw the bulldog, you know. When the enemy comes against us and we speak the word of God and we're standing where we need to be with God and the enemy flees, don't get puffed up. Just look behind you because then you'll see that the fact that Jesus is standing behind you. He's in the boat with you. He's there with you. He's promised to be. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you even unto the end of the age. There's one other scripture that always, that I, that I, I guess I, I won't say I struggled with, but I knew it. But, you know, I mean, I never really contemplated it. But in Psalm 138.2, it says, I will worship toward your holy temple. This is the Psalm of David speaking to the Lord, right? And I will praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. God honors his word even above his name. Now, why is that? His name is glorious. His name is magnificent. Magnificent. He's the, he's the provider. I mean, his name is just unbelievable. 
But God has poured his nature and himself into the Bible, into his word. So he honors his word because his word honors him. His word honors him and exalts him. And if we know his word, then we'll exalt the Lord and we'll honor the Lord in our activities and everything that we do all of the time. So that's why he can say, I honor my word even above my name. Because if you know my word, then you're going to honor my name and you're going to exalt me wherever I go. So praise God. I mean, how important is that, though, for God to tell us that he honors his word even above his name? I mean, you know, that struck me as, wow. I mean, we can't, we have to know the power that's in this word. If God honors it even above his name, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive, and we need to know it, and we need to know it inside and out. Because when the enemy comes against us, just like he did Jesus in the desert, we need to be able to quote Scripture. We need to be able to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm covered with the blood. Repeat Psalm 91, that God says he'll give his angels charge over me. That, you know, we need to know who we are in Christ. Because, you know, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on. And if we don't know who we are in Christ, then we can be tripped, tripped. Uh, tripped up or, or tricked. Now the words, when we read the word of God, it's the Holy Spirit that makes them anointed to us. And he himself, the Holy Spirit himself is bringing the, 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 the meaning of the word. And that's why in God's, in God's word, he always gives you what you need for that time. You know, there are times when I read the same scripture and I get something totally different new, a new revelation. It's not that God changed his word. It's that that's what I needed for that day. That's what I needed for that time. The last time I read it, I might have needed something else. So God revealed something totally different to me at that time. So it's alive. It's powerful. And God keeps touching and and moving in our lives when we allow his word to take root in us. It's the truth. The word of God is truth. Every word in this book is true. Don't let anybody deceive you. You know, there are a lot of liberal Christians out there that go to church and they read the Bible, but, you know, they, ah, you know, have you ever had a conversation with somebody who says, I'm a born-again Christian, and I'm not questioning that they are, but then they start questioning, well, the Bible was for that day. It really isn't for today, and it doesn't really mean that. I think it means this. And then they, they want to give you this lofty, thou shalt not kill. Well, I don't know if it really means thou shalt not kill. Well, it seems pretty straightforward to me. You know, <laughs> thou shalt not kill. Well, I don't know if he was talking about physical death. He might have been talking about spiritual. Well, it says thou shalt not kill. Let's not make it, let's not overcomplicate the word of God. God makes it simple. He wrote it in words that we can understand. You know, even though King James sometimes we struggle with, but, you know, the, and that's another thing. You know, people, and I've known people that said the only way, the only way to read the Bible is the King James. Every other version is not. The best Bible for you to read, the best version for you to read is the one that you understand and the one that you'll read. Okay, that's, that's simple. I mean, they're, they're all, I mean, there are some that are paraphrases, some that are exact. I mean, as long as it's the, the translation, a, just a different translation, that's fine. But read the one that you're comfortable with. Read the one that you'll read and that you'll allow God to bring meaning to, into your life. You know, the, the Word of God reveals the nature and the attributes of God. When you read the Bible, when you read the Word of God, you see God's love the patience that he has for us. And, you know, he needs to have patience with us, right? His power at work in our lives. His wisdom. I mean, there's, there's such wisdom in the word of God. God is just, is, he is, he is wisdom. And his, his comfort. Sometimes we just need God to give us wisdom in a situation. It's here. Sometimes we need God to give us comfort for something we're going through. It's here. Sometimes we need God to, to show us patience. It's here. Sometimes we just need to feel his love, unconditional love around us. It's here. Whatever your need is, the Bible has an answer for you. And now I'm going to move into the last part of my message, 
which is it also reveals the promises that God has for us. God, God's promises are great for his people. Once we're saved, he's most concerned with salvation and, you know, conviction of sin and repentance. We talked about that, our lifestyle and how we live. But whatever your need is, whatever you have need in your life, I'm here to tell you that God cares about it, okay? God knows about it, and God cares about it, and God wants to answer you. God wants to answer you. In Romans 8, 28, these are scriptures that all of us should know, but I want to repeat them because I want them to get into your spirit so you understand. And it says, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Whatever you're going through today, I'm telling you, all things will work together for good if you love God and if you're called according to your purpose. If you're called according to your own purpose, no. But if you're called according to his purpose, yes. If, if his purpose is the most important thing to you, if his grace is sufficient for you, if, he, you, know, if, you, if you really love him, then he wants to pour out his blessings. There's so many scriptures that, you know, I, I can't even, what Satan meant for evil, God will turn around for good to those who love him. Ephesians uh, 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think of or imagine, some verses say, versions say, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine. Can you imagine that? I didn't mean it to sound that way. Can you imagine that God wants to do more than you can imagine? But he does. But it takes faith also. Another component is faith. When we read the word of God and we know God and we know Jesus and we have the power of the name of Jesus, then we have to have faith. Because the Bible also tells us that in Hebrews that without faith it's impossible to please God. But how do we get faith? It says faith comes by hearing and hearing what? By the word of God. So our faith is built up when we read the word of God. You know, God is not a man that he can lie. If he said it in his word, he'll make it come to pass. Whatever he says to us, he will make come to pass. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I know some of you are probably going through some difficult times. I know you know, we've gone through difficult times at different places in our life, and you're holding on to God, and you're, you're, you're seeking God, and you're asking him that you may need a healing. You may need a restoration of a marriage or a relationship. You may need financial blessings. You may need deliverance, or somebody close to you may need deliverance. And, you know, you may have been praying about it and saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? I've been praying on this, and, and I don't see an answer. I don't see anything coming to pass. Let me encourage you with this. God has heard your prayer, and God has answered your prayer. Okay? God is a God who answers prayer. God, there's provision in his word to answer every situation you're in, whether it's sickness whether it's, you know, health, whether it's uh, marriage, whether it's relationship, whether it's, you know, drugs problems with you or somebody else, whatever it might be, financial. He has, you know, Dave talked about it today. You know, when you're faithful in your tithes and offerings, he says, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that there won't be room enough to contain, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Well, you know, it's important that he rebuke the devourer because the enemy is a thief. The enemy tries to devour and steal everything that he can from you, your health, your finances, your relationships. In John 10.10, 10, what does it say? For the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But, Jesus said, but, and I love the buts, but Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what we need to hold on to today. That's what we need to hold on to. 
you know, Daniel, there's in Daniel, maybe put the scripture up, Daniel 10, 12 through 13. If you, I don't know if you, you know, some of you may know this, but Daniel was praying and he was seeking God and he was looking for an answer. And, you know, Daniel was just, he, he couldn't understand, why, where's the answer? Why don't I have, why isn't God giving me an answer? And then the angel came to Daniel. He says, and then he said to me, the angel said to Daniel, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. From the first day that Daniel let his request be known unto God, the Bible says, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, from the very first day, he wasn't getting an answer. But the angel finally broke through, and he said, what? He said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who is Satan, it's the enemy, withstood me 21 days. And behold, then God sent Michael, the archangel, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So, you know, hold on, people. The answer has been sent. I'm here to tell you, whatever you've been praying for through 2014, and maybe it goes back into 2013, well, there's a new year coming, and it's 2015. And you know what? Hold on, because the answer has been set, but sent, but the enemy is going gonna, is gonna to block it. We just need to make sure that we're in a position that we can stand before the enemy in the, in the name of Jesus and with the blood of Jesus and with the word of God and rebuke him and say, get out. You have no more authority in my life. I surrender this day to God, my God, and I give my life to him. And then that will help and the answer will break through. You know, we, we need to be waiting anxiously for the, for the answer that God has given us. You know, I mentioned earlier my daughter Jessica, and I'm going to give her a little plug because there was a blog that she did that, that she gave a few weeks back that really just touched my heart, and it just brought memories back to me, and I think it applies. You know, she has uh, womengetreal.org is a website, and she reaches out to women and, you know, to, to meet the needs of women, some of the issues that women face. But, men, I'm going to tell you, you can read it too. I read it. <laughs> I read it. I read it because it's my daughter, but she blesses me and she'll bless you too. Because you know what? God has given us women because, you know what, men? I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of times, we need the woman to straighten us out. We need a godly woman to come up alongside of us to lead us in the right direction because, you know, we can be thick, Okay. I'll end with that. We can be thick. So, but I mean, and, and, and she told the story, and it touched me because it was about uh, my wife Louise and myself. And, you know, years ago, we used to have big Christmas Eve parties at our house. We used to have, you know, 40 people show up, aunts, uncles, you know, grandparents, you know, my, our parents and sisters, brothers, and all the ne nieces and nephews. And we used to exchange gifts on Christmas Eve. That used to be the tradition. But Louise always, always, and I'm going to blame her for this, for the kids, but no, uh, Louise always said that you can't open the gifts till 9 o'clock. You know, people would show up at 6, and you can imagine young kids, you know, well, here's all your gifts from your aunts and your uncles, but you can't open them until 9 o'clock. So this anticipation was building in them, and, you know, what time is it? What time is it? So three hours had to go by, and then about 10 minutes before 9, you know, so everybody, have all the kids sit down, and we put all the, the gifts again from the aunts and uncles, and, you know, a good stack of gifts in front of them, and say, but you can't open them until 9 o'clock. So they'd sit there with the gifts on their laps, and they'd, you know, be wanting to open them, but say, you can't open them until 9. And then we have a grandfather clock that all of a sudden would start to chime, and then Louise would start with the 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five, all the way down. Okay, open them. And boom, there was a flurry of, 
gift paper, wrapping paper, and all of everything flying around as they looked at these gifts. But you know what, what the kids, and, and you don't realize it, but what she remembered about that, and I'm sure my son remembers too, was the anticipation and the excitement, you know, the knowing that there was something good in those boxes, something that they wanted, but they couldn't, you know, they couldn't just grab it and look. You had to wait for it, but you knew it was coming. You knew that it was coming. You knew 9 o'clock was almost there. And the closer it got to 9 o'clock, your heart would beat because you'd know pretty soon I can open these gifts. Pretty soon it's going to happen. Pretty soon I can see what's inside of these gifts that are waiting for me right here. My story is this, or my message is this. People, when we pray and we ask God, you know, his scripture says what? If your son were to ask for bread, would you give him a stone? If he were to ask for a fish, would you give him a serpent instead? And if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give good gifts to his children? You are his children, and 9 o'clock is almost here. So whatever you've been waiting for, I'm telling you, 9 o'clock is almost here. The countdown has begun. Whatever you're holding on to. You know, years ago, the church used to hold on. They used to say, hold on. They used to have tent meetings. Hold on to the horns of the altar and pray it through. And just get on your face before the Lord. My wife and I throughout our lives have had to spend complete nights on our face before the Lord just holding on to to, to his promises, standing on his word and saying, God, I know you're faithful. You promised that you would do this. You're not going to leave me now. You said you'd never leave me for nor forsake me. And I'm telling you, he, he wants to do the same thing for you. So whatever you've been praying for, whether it's healing, whether it's finances, whether it's restoration of relationships, whether it's peace, You know, maybe you have emotional turmoil and you don't understand why. Whether it's some kind of an addiction or separation, relationship problems. I don't know what it is, but he does. He knows. And from the first day that you, the first day that you let your request be known unto God with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, he sent the answer. And maybe the enemy is blocking it, but I'm telling you, it's 10, 9, Eight, seven, the answer is on the way, and it's here. As you go into 2015, people, go in with the power and the authority that God has given us, but also with the reverence of knowing who God is, that he loves us so much, that he cares for us so much, that he's taking care of all of our needs. Praise God. Praise God. People, 2015, don't worry about what's going on around you. Don't worry about it. Make preparation for it. Be ready. Listen to the Lord to ask him what you should do. But, you know, whatever you're waiting for, just believe that you... God says, when you pray, believe that you have what you ask for, and you shall get it. So when you pray, God doesn't want you to come before him. He wants you to know who you are in him not who you are in yourself. He wants you to know who you are in him. And in him, we're heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We're sons of God. We can cry out to him and say, Abba, Father. We can come to him with our problems. We can come to him with our requests. And he answers us. He always answers us. So that's my message for today. And a message of encouragement. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Walk in the strength and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Walk from this place today saying, 10, 9, start the countdown because the answer is on the way. The answer is on the way. Start the countdown because God has. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this message. 
Father, I pray that your word, your Father, you, you tell us that your word cannot return void, that it always goes out and accomplishes that to which it is sent. Father, I thank you for that promise, O oh Lord, in your word. Father, and I thank you, Lord God. I pray that, that every person here, Lord, would be changed by your word, O oh Lord God, and that we would walk from this place with a new spring in our step, meet every need in this place, O oh Lord God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. I'm going to be here. But, I, you know, I just feel the anointing in this place right now. And if you've been waiting on God for something, and you know, if you've got doubt or fear or whatever you get, whatever's going on in your life, I don't know. But, you know, the place to leave it is right here. The place to leave it is right here at the altar of God. So walk from this place knowing who you are in, in, in Christ Jesus. Walk from this place with power, with authority, and the Word of God, the power of God, the name of Jesus, and with faith. Amen. Praise. as you're leaving. I'm going to wish you a happy new year, but more than that, I'm going to pray you a happy new year. It will be a happy new year. It will be a happy new year. Again, I don't know what you're going through, but it will be. With God, all things are possible. Amen? Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Have a great week, everyone.